Good morning, everyone. I already feel very blessed. Um, I love it when I see people using their gifts for God's glory. And they could use it for many other ways, um, but it's beautiful for people to come to church and um, share with us. So thank you very much for that, guys. Um, so I was asked to share my testimony today, and I was someone who thought that I never actually had a testimony um, because I've always loved God my whole life. Um, however, I learned that every single person has a testimony because that's how God has worked in your life. And this is how God worked in mine. So my name is Rochelle Ford, for anyone who doesn't know, and I am the child of a loving mother, and the Lord was my father. I have a twin brother named Ryan, so I would know what I would look like if I was male, and I have a younger brother named Liam. I rarely think of the person that I'm supposed to call my dad. Even the word to say is weird on my lips because I've never really said it. Unfortunately, my dad was quite aggressive. He didn't seem overly aggressive when him and my mum were dating, but when they got married, that's when things changed. I have some graphic memories of my brother being like thrown against the wall and, and landing on his bed. He used to throw us downstairs and step on our stomachs. And um, one day he just said to me, go and find a new dad. And he, and he locked me outside. Um, we had a bathroom which had the, a lock on it and it was the only door that had a lock. So that was like our safe place. That's where we went to hide from dad. My mum didn't know that he was aggressive towards us because she was a flight attendant and he was only physically aggressive to us while she was away. Mum never spoke badly about him um, throughout our lives growing up, um, but a few years ago I started to push her and wanted to know what their relationship was like. And um, she told me that yes, he was um, physically abusive to her as well. There would be times when she'd be holding us as babies and young kids and she'd be trying to protect us and then he would just be hitting, hitting her. And um, I love my mom and I'm very protective of the people around me and I think that's why. And I'm disgusted that she was hurt, but I just love how even in those moments she was protecting us as well. Um, mom found out though that he was physically hurting us. We were in the bath one day and we had a lot of bruises and stuff on our bodies and she asked, where did we get these from? And we finally told her. And this is the, the moment in my life that changed the direction that it could have gone. Mum got us out of the bath and took us straight to the police station and um, left my dad. And I think if she didn't do that, my life could have been very different. We went to docs and they put you in separate rooms and they ask you about your life and your story. And they believed our story until my dad arrived. And he convinced them that it was all, all fake. So he must have been very... Um, very strong in his conviction about that, unfortunately. I've never had too many issues, though. I used to be very scared of the dark and for men, about men for a little while. However, um, by the grace of God, I got over those things. And I believe that because my mom showed me that that is not how a father treats their children. She showed me that God is love and that I had the best father in the world, and that was God. And she just showed me that love, and I'd never felt like I was actually missing anything. As you can tell, I love my mom. <laughs> she raised us all with no child support, and God told her one day to homeschool us. She got told the verse, Romans 12, 2, and it says, And do not be conformed to the ways of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It was God's will for my mum to homeschool us. And so she did. My mum gave up everything for us. And we always felt loved. I grew up in a non-denominational home, a Christian church. And I have many memories of me and my family all holding hands and praying every day. From that denomination, I learned that God is a God of love. We were in Sunday school together and mum would lead out for the kids and we'd join in as well. And um, I have wonderful memories of that. We were very poor, like we had very little money, but we never went without. God always provided. In Matthew 6 verse 25 and then in verse 32 it says, and this is God speaking, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body or what you will put on. For your heavenly Father knows that you need these things. And then verse 32, it says, but seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. 
God prayed daily and placed our lives in God's hands and he continually provided. We had money just arrive in our box. Mum would check her bank account and there was money there. And we things were tight, but God always provided. And I know that he's providing for me today. Another thing that was amazing that I even got to do because we were quite poor is ballet. So I was a ballet dancer and I was extremely shy as and say, what's your name? I would just cry and hide behind mum, like very shy. Mum's like, we need to do something about this. So she put me into ballet and I loved it, but I was terrible. Like I couldn't touch my toes and graceful was not a word that you would say around me. <laughs> um, but I absolutely loved it. And it made me a really good, like a good sport. The only other sport I ever did was little athletics, so running track. And I came last every single week every week, actually, except once. And apparently the girl was crying in the corner and I walked over to her and I put my arm around her and I was like, it's okay, I lose every week. And then we went away together. I was very used to it. <laughs> but I really, I really loved ballet. Um, it actually happened to be a bring a friend day to dance. And me and my brother had kind of been having a bit of a competition. He thought that hockey was harder I thought the ballet was harder. And so I was like, okay, well, it's bring a friend day. So come along and we'll try it out for yourself. And I wanted to prove how hard it was. Turns out he was the naturally talented twin. He turns up, he has amazing feet. He, has, he can jump really high. He has flat turnout. He's even like flexible naturally. And I was like, I've had to work so hard for all these things. Anyway, he loved it. And I think he liked the challenge of starting late and having to catch up. But now I got to do dancing with my brother as well. And that was an incredible, incredible blessing as well. Because I was very inflexible and couldn't do the splits, my mum used to even stretch with me and my brother. She got third in the Commonwealth Games for synchronized swimming. So she was used to a dancing art form. And so she would say, you know, whoever gets the splits first gets this prize and, and things like that. She was very supportive. Again, I wasn't naturally talented, but I believe that working hard for something means that you appreciate it and you love it more. A lot of girls start dancing when they're young. Everyone wants to be a ballerina. And then as it gets harder, the numbers dwindle. I was used to having to work hard from the beginning. So when it got harder, I was like, oh, okay, this is just the next stage. And I stuck with it. From the age of 15, I started traveling to Sydney, and that took about two hours on the bus and the train. And I went there and back six days a week, and we trained for nine hours a day, and I did that with my brother. We did some auditions, and one month later, we arrived in New York City from a homeschooled, definitely overprotected family to me and my brother with our suitcase in New York City. It was a very big contrast. But I loved this time because that's when my faith became my own. I had to decide whether I was going to get on that subway and, and join the church, or I can just go and stay and hang out with my friends. To be honest, it was an easy decision because church had always been an amazing part of my life. So we got on that train every week and, and we went to church. But I liked that it became my own. Two years later, my brother um, returned to Australia and joined the Australian Army opposite of ballet. <laughs> and um, at this time, my friends got into drugs and, and alcohol and started partying. And I just praised God because God was there for me. And I was never tempted to do those activities. The ballet world can be quite brutal. Um, a lot of girls have a lot of self-esteem issues because you're standing in a leotard and tights and you're looking at the mirror and you're striving for this perfection that isn't attainable. The teachers screaming at you saying, do this, do this, and, and you're forcing your body into very interesting positions, you know, and um, yeah, it's very hard, and there's always someone better than you. The teachers have gone up to a few of my friends, and if they have any fat on them, they'd point to it and say, oh, look, marshmallow, you know, it's, it's, it's quite brutal, and you generally have to be around 50 kilos. In Europe, they'd weigh the students. Um, in America and Australia, they don't, praise the Lord. Um, but yeah, they're, you're very much expected to have a certain physique. Um, a lot of my friends had bulimia or anorexia or used to cut themselves, and they had really hard, hard situations to go through. Um, but I had God. 
And I believe because I wasn't just Rochelle the dancer, I was Rochelle the child of God, and that gave me an identity. I knew I was loved. I knew I was created, and I knew that there was a savior out there who died for me personally. And I know that he wouldn't want me to do that or go through those issues. So I didn't struggle with that, and I praise God for that. So I was always known as the Christian girl. Some people were trying to be me and called me like overly Christian. What they didn't know was that that's a very big compliment to me. Um, but looking back, I was very lukewarm. And the worst part about being lukewarm is that you don't know the state that you are in. In Revelation 3, God speaks to the Laodicean and lukewarm church. And he says in verse 15, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, I have become wealthy and have need of nothing. Yet you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked. This was the state that I was in. I used to say, oh, I'm, I'm a good Christian. I like, don't sin that much. I clearly didn't see the state that I was in. I was so selfish. What if I had been committed to God? What if I had read my Bible so that I could have had that Bible knowledge to share to people? I could have been a light in that industry where, to be honest, I was the only Christian that I knew, but I didn't share. And that's one of the biggest regrets of my life. I was very dedicated though. Um, as I said, I trained nine hours a day, six days a week from the age of 15 to 25, which was two years ago. So I did some maths and that was about 27,000 hours of dancing or over three years of nonstop dancing. So it was a lot of hours. Um, I didn't have the best technique in the classrooms, but I always got the leading roles. And I believe that's because passion can be seen and sometimes it can't be taught. And I was very blessed. Um, I have done some amazing productions, but I've also pulled my hamstring on stage. I have dropped a prop, like a fan, and I just want you to picture, picture white swans. You've got Swan Lake going on, and then you've got Rochelle there standing here, and then I sneeze. Not very balletic. <laughs> I had a really challenging dance in New York, and my mum was fortunate enough to come and watch me do it. She'd seen me dance from four years of old, and she was at every single performance, doing my hair, doing my makeup, getting all the costumes right, always supporting me. And she finally got to see me dance after four years. The stage was incredibly slippery, and all my friends were slipping in the performance, but me and mum prayed beforehand, and I didn't slip once. God cares about the big things, but he also cares about the little things. I was taking my final curtsy and I got to look up and I made eye contact with my mum. And it was like God just gave me that blessing of all these people watching and it was like I got to have that moment with my mum. And she's like crying so much and so proud, but it was a beautiful moment that I will always remember. I was very comfortable in New York and I believe this is why God told me to move. I was asking for a sign though because I really wanted to know that it was what God wanted for me gave me that sign and I think I was more surprised that God gave me the sign than having to move to Europe. God doesn't see people in different levels. He, he believes that all of us are equal and he cares about me and his other people and I think that was an eye-opener to me knowing, oh you've answered my prayer, thank you Lord. I gave away most of my possessions as I wanted to just take one suitcase with me to Europe and four days later, I arrived in Frankfurt, Germany, not knowing where I was going to sleep that night. And for me, um, I'm a very type A individual. I like plans, itineraries, I like to know what's going to happen in the future. And so normally that would be very stressful for me. But I felt calm because God was with me and God was guiding me. I traveled around Europe and I went to 15 different countries doing audition after audition. And I did this all without a phone. Again, I was still quite cheap. So I had an iPod and I'd go to a hostel and I'd screenshot the route of how to get to the bus and how to get to the train. And, and it's quite complicated because you don't speak the language. Um, again, God was with me in that situation as well. I was doing audition after audition and um, I just want to give you a piece of what it could be like in an audition. So I had got on a 16, uh, 19 hour bus ride and I slept in a hostel where 
there were so many snoring people, it felt like an orchestra. And I did not sleep that night. Um, I get up in the morning and you prepare, you're stretching, you're mentally preparing yourself for this audition. And I step into the, the classroom because they want to see your technique. And I started the first exercise and I slowly see people walking out of the room. And I, I didn't know what they were doing. I was trying to focus on what I was doing. And the director was looking at me and I was like, great, he's walking towards me. He's going to offer me a contract. I'm so excited. And then he says, thank you for coming. You may leave now. And I was gutted because you've just put so much time and effort into it. And it can be really brutal. Because they can say, we want one girl who's blonde, and we've actually already hired her, but we're not going to let you know that. You know, it's quite hard. Um, but God blessed. I ended up in Switzerland, and I tour around, toured around with a company there, and I joined a ballet company in Bulgaria, and yeah, I was very blessed. But at this time, my granddad passed away, and he was the person who was always sitting beside my mom at every production. And he said that he was very fulfilled with his life except he was waiting to walk me down the aisle. That was the last thing he wanted to do. I hadn't met my husband at the time, so he unfortunately didn't get to do that. However, I know that one day I'll be able to link arms with him and walk with him in heaven. And that is a hope and a peace that I can have that I will never take for granted. There are famous last words that people have written down in books and on the internet. You can look this up. And, and some people, are they're really scared in those last moments because they don't know what's coming next. And then there are people who know that the next moment that they're going to open their eyes, Jesus is going to be returning and they're going to see his face. And that gives them this hope and this calmness in this moment. My favorite one that I read in a book said that a woman was surrounded by her family and they were singing a song. And her last words before she passed away were, swing low sweet chariot coming forth to carry me home. Around this time I was in Switzerland and there was no English speaking churches in the country. Well not around me. And that was really hard because I missed the community. What we have in this place is absolutely beautiful. We're like-minded people and we can come together every week and it's a community that I also don't ever want to take for granted. But at this time my mum met and married a Seventh-day Adventist man. And my first question was, what's a Seventh-day Adventist? I'd never even heard of the denomination before. But Cedric Hendricks is his name, and he showed me what a godly man really looks like. I started to learn about the truths of the Bible, and then I learned this thing called the Sabbath. And I had been going to church on Sunday, and i have been dancing every single Sunday since I was four. So this was very new to me. And it took a while for me to process and a few Bible studies to acknowledge. Um, but I realized that my life is going to have to really change if I'm going to accept this truth. God started, shutting, God started shutting the doors of my career and I knew that it was coming to an end. It was a day that I always dreaded. It was Rochelle the dancer. That's who I felt I was. Um, and if I was worldly and I didn't have God, I know I'd be a mess. But God gave me an amazing adventure, and he also gave me a new heart. And I have a new passion now, and that is to share the gospel. And it was God or dancing. And I think most people in their life have to make this, their own version of this choice. And God helped me make the decision to follow him, and it was the best decision that I've ever made. I couldn't call myself a Seventh-day Adventist yet because I couldn't tell everyone what they believed. And I didn't want to call myself that until I knew. And God led me to do the Arise program. And I applied that day. As soon as I heard about it, I didn't want anyone to convince me not to do it. I wanted to go to Arise because I wanted to learn about the Bible. I wanted to learn how to give a Bible study because I'd never given one before. And I wanted to know what I believed and why. I always had a picture of the woman that I would be when I was married. And that woman knew her Bible, and she was a mentor, and she loved on people, and she shared the gospel. And as hard as it was to realize, I wasn't that woman. I didn't know a life without Jesus, but I was lazy with my personal devotions. I'd never done them before. And I believe that's why my Bible, Bible knowledge was so little. I believe it's a decision that we all need to make every single morning. And if you're busy, it's a decision you have to make the night before about what time you go to bed so that you can plan to do your devotions in the morning. 
the Arise program changed my life, that I would say that my devotions was the thing that actually like, changed it so much more for the better. Because you can't have a relationship without communication. And that's what gave me a communication. And that's where I learned about God through that Bible and through that prayer every morning. So I never pictured myself Bible working. Uh, during a rise, there's a lot of conversation about, are you going to Bible work after? Um, because there's an option to do so. And I would say to everyone, are you going to do it? Oh, that's great. I'll be praying for you. Oh, no, I can't do it. I need, I need a new career. Um, but one day I prayed to God and I said, Lord, if there is anything in my life that I haven't surrendered, if there's anything you want me to do, I'm closed off to, I pray that you will show me that. Did about Bible working. I ran to the bathroom crying my eyes out because I didn't want to do it. And the reason I didn't want to do it was because I didn't think I could. I'm not like these Seventh-day Adventists that I'm new. I don't know everything about the Bible. And that was the main reason. I felt bad for the church that would get me. But it's not about me. It's about what God can do through me, and I needed to stop underestimating that. I remember my first meeting with the pastor, Blake Penland, uh, for Raymond Terrace Mission Adventist Church. That's who I worked for. And I was crying, and I was saying, look, I will try as hard as I can, but I won't get any Bible studies, and I'm kind of sorry that you got me. But again, I was underestimating God. I was so worried. I was so stressed. I don't have money. I don't have a career. I don't have a full-time job. What am I going to contribute to my future husband? Until Blake was like, why are you stressing? You're exactly where God wants you to be. And isn't that the best place to be? And I was like, okay, that's true. And Bible working was the best experience of my life. Topped every dance performance. Because you go into that Bible study and you see the Holy Spirit work. And your Bible knowledge grows so much because you're having to prepare those studies before you go into them. You see lives change. And I believe that the greatest evidence for the existence of God is a changed life. And you get to see that continually while Bible working. There was nothing better. You don't need to know everything about the Bible as well. God uses what you have. And if I waited until I knew the Bible front to back and was really confident to give Bible studies, I never would have given one. In the going is the growing, right? God will use your knowledge. And if you don't know the answer to a question, you can just say, that is an awesome question. And we're going to study that next week. And you go and you study that during the week. And that's how your Bible knowledge grows as well. I was enrolled in nursing because I wanted to be a midwife until I got a call from Matt Parra in the North New South Wales Conference. And he says, we want you to be the dean for the ARISE program. And then we want you to Bible work in Mwollomba for the next six months. And I was really excited to accept that offer. Um, a dean is where you're, you're mentoring and supporting the girls in the ARISE program. I was excited because this job would make me be out of my comfort zone. And I'd have to remain on my knees and praying to God and, and accountable, accountable to my Bible and to my devotions and things like that. I didn't want to rise to be the highlight of my faith. And so I accepted the offer and I'm really glad that I did. This is where I met my now husband, Houston Ford. And see, when you follow God's plan, some good things can happen as well. Um, I never knew that I would have such a godly, supporting, caring husband who loves God. We both had the same trajectory, and I'd never met a guy like that. And God exceeded my expectations so much, and I will forever be grateful for that. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. I'm now studying chaplaincy and counseling because I want to be a school chaplain and I want to share the gospel for my career. I don't want anyone around me saying, what's a Seventh-day Adventist? We have the Great Commission and we need to share. And because I know that God has changed my life, I want everyone to have that experience. And that's what you do as Bible workers. You're knocking on those doors because you want to see the Holy Spirit in their lives. You want a better life for everyone because God wants us to have that abundant life. And I'm now focused and determined on becoming the woman that God wants me to be and lead people to him. We're all going to go to heaven one day and I don't want to look back and say, I should have shared to this person that I know. And I believe that we all have that person in our life that we could share to. And I just didn't want to look back with regret. 
so I hope that I will do that job right. My favorite story from Bible working is through a guy named James. Me and my friend Nyla, who were Bible working together, we go in pairs to the doors. And we knocked on his door, and then we noticed a sign, and it said, please walk around to the side door. And we're like, okay, sure. We went to the side door, and then the, and there was another sign that said, please go to the back door. And we're like, okay, a little creepy, but, you know, we prayed, and we were like, Lord, please protect us um, at this house, because we feel like we should still knock on this door. And we walk up to the door, and we knock, and this man is there, but he's on a walker, and he's quite older he's older than us and we thought okay I think we're going to be safe we've got God God guiding us and I said would you like to have Bible studies and he said yes and for any Bible worker you're like right really like okay act chill like (laughs) um he later told us that he meant to say no next minute he had two girls giving him a Bible study God is good you give an appeal at the end of every Bible study and I just didn't feel like he was fully grasping it. And, and I felt like something might have been stopping him from surrendering fully to Jesus. And so I asked him. And he said, yes, there is something that's stopping me. I'm actually, a part, of, I'm actually part of the occult. And I was like, oh, okay. I had no idea what it was. I went home and I did a Google search and found out that he was worshipping Satan. Again, God was protecting us in this environment. This guy changed his life. He started to grab the Bible with both hands and his life transformed. Can everyone open up their Bibles, please, to Acts 19? And we're going to read verse 19 as well. Acts 19, verse 19. Acts 19, verse 19. And it's speaking about people that were worshipping, well, as you'll see in the verse, um, they were worshipping with magic. And it says, Many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. What I like about this is that they didn't sell the books. They could have got a lot of money. That's a lot of money. Today, that would equal multi- like multiple millions of dollars but they sold them so no one else could read them. Me and James were talking about this verse and chapter, and he said, Rochelle, I want to do the same thing. My house is full of books, and we'd always been in one little room, so I didn't know. And he said, I want to do the same thing, and and would you guys be okay to burn them because I don't want to sell them? And I was like, yes, we can. And so we came to his house the following day, and it took us hours because his house was full of things that... He said, I don't want anything in my house that isn't going to glorify God. So he took it all out with his approval. And his house was nearly empty. And that was a rebuke to me. This guy had gone from worshipping Satan to hearing about God to giving up everything that he had. He changed his life around completely and he surrendered it all. And sometimes I'm here like, oh, I really like this thing. I don't want to surrender this to God. And I think that James is just an inspiration in that moment, and I have to remember that. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, they become new. James now is a new person, and he is so much better for it. He surrendered all, and he got baptized. And when we're walking to the pool that he ended up getting baptized with, I held his hand, and we walked strolling. He no longer has a walker. His mind, his depression has lifted so much. He goes out of the house now. He has a Bible worker living at his house. His life is completely different. He got baptized, and to see that transformation again, Bible working is an amazing experience. God fought for me when I wasn't fully surrendered to him. Jesus died for me, and now by me surrendering my life to God, I was selfish. I put myself first. I put my dance career above God. I've put checking my Facebook above doing my devotions. I wasn't surrendered to Jesus, but God held on to me. Because he is a patient and loving God. And he knew that with his Holy Spirit in me, that one day I would surrender to him. 
I want to ask you today, what are you putting above God? Is there anything in your life that is stopping you from completely surrendering to Jesus? Satan will use any device and he knows your weaknesses. What is that one thing that's coming to your mind right now? We all have something. And with that, when we struggle with that, but I know that with God's help, you can surrender that to God today. I believe that God will give you the strength to surrender all. And if you have thought of something, I ask that you will pray with me now as you surrender that to God. Dear Heavenly Father, I just firstly thank you for your Sabbath day. I thank you because knowing the Sabbath is what changed my life and freed me. I thank you that we can be here and we can celebrate you and your creation together. I pray that you will fill everyone with the Holy Spirit today in this room. And I pray that if you have made them think of something that they need to surrender to you, then you will give them the strength because you are the King of Kings and you are the Lord of Lords. And we can do all things through you who strengthen us. I pray that we will surrender this thing to you and we will never take it back, that we will put it on the altar, Lord. I thank you for your love, Lord, and I just pray that every single person in this room will be a beacon of light in their environment for you. May we never get lukewarm. May we never be complacent. May we always shine for you and share that gospel so that one day we can get to heaven and you can say, well done, good and faithful servant. Thank you for your beautiful day, and thank you for all of the blessings that we have. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys. I hope you all have a wonderful Sabbath.